Good, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Friends, welcome to church this morning. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, we are beginning today uh, and with uh, a slight uh, change in what was our, our ongoing uh, sermon series plan. Um, I had planned uh, but when, I, when I left for Colorado uh, before Christmas that today we will be resuming with our series on, on one sermon per book of the Bible and we'd be getting to the book of Esther today. But intervening events that I'm sure all of you are now more than familiar with um, at the state capitol and across our country have um, instilled in me uh, a need to return to the, the center and the heart of the gospel this morning. And so rather than proceeding with a sermon on the book of Esther, uh, which we will do next week, I wanted this morning to come back to one of the most important places in the Bible. And that is in the fifth and sixth chapters of the gospel of Matthew. Herein are recounted the, the words of Jesus and his sermon on the mount. This is the most public sermon that Jesus gives in our gospel memory. And it is a sermon that he gives to his disciples meant to be overheard by an enormous crowd of people. We had someone speaking before an enormous crowd of people on Monday. Someone who has created a platform and who has created a massive hearing for himself. But unlike Jesus, this person who commands one of the largest platforms in human history has decided to use that platform not to sow the truth, but to sow untruth. Not to be an ambassador for peace, but to be an ambassador for confrontation. And so this morning, friends, I wanna invite you to join a different crowd. I wanna invite you to come back to the mountain, to tune your ears in your heart, to hear a central and core message of the only man who is truly our savior. I hope you'll come with me, friends, as we try to listen anew to the words of Jesus in this strange and dangerous time in the life of our society. And I pray that you will ask a question, not so much what can we get away with as Christians, but rather what is asked of us. Friends, will you join your hearts and your minds for worship this morning?
Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms. Mike, I don't see it on my screen. I don't know what's happening with that. Whatever's going on is on your end. Huh. Let's see. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Let me see if I can change this now. Here we go. Es ist aus Grund meines Herzens von der gottlosen Wesen gesprochen, dass keine Gottesfurcht bei ihnen ist. Sie schmücken sich untereinander selbst, dass sie ihre böse Sache fördern und andere ver- ver- verunglimpfen. Alle ihre Worte sind schädlich und erlögen. erlögen. Sie lassen sich auch nicht weisen, dass sie Gutes täten, sondern die trachten auf ihrem Lager nach Schaden und stehen fest auf dem bösen Weg und scheue kein Arges. Herr, deine Güte reicht, so weit der Himmel ist, und deine Wahrheit so weit die Völken gehen. Deine Gerechtigkeit steht die Berge Gottes und dein Recht wie eine große Tiefe. Herr, du hilfst Menschen und Vieh. Wie teuer ist deine Güte, Gott, dass Menschenkinder unter dem Schaden der Flügel zu Flücht haben. Sie werden trunken von den reichen Gütern deines Hauses und du tränkest sie mit Wohne als mit einem Strom. Denn bei ihr ist die Quelle des Lebens. Und in deinem Licht sehen wir das Licht. Breite deine Güte über die, die dich kennen und deine Gerechtigkeit über die Frommen. Lass mich nicht von den Stolzen untertreten werden und die Hand der Gotteslosen stürze mich nicht, sondern lass sie, die Übertäter, das Selbst fallen, dass sie verstoßen werden und nicht bleiben mögen. Will you join me as we sing our first hymn this morning?
A big thank you to Amador and Sewan for bringing us that music this week. Jesus Christus, das Leben der Welt, Jesus Christ, the life of the world. In a time like now, friends, when we are feeling a strange mixture of anger and fear, of resentment and a desire to, to go to action in some way, we have no excuse as the church to look for the source of our life anywhere but in Christ himself. We will find, if we look for the source of our life in the economy, that we never have enough and that those we see around us are only ever trying to take what we have. If we set our life in politics, we will discover enemies at every corner waiting for our vigilance to fall that they might take advantage of us. If we set store by any form of imagined prosperity, we will find scarcity at every turn. It is only when we turn to Jesus Christ himself as our centermost defining feature that we will find that we have bread for the day. We will find that we have provision enough for the road ahead of us, that we have light to take the next step. Friends, as people who would be disciples of Jesus Christ, as people who would seek the heart of this world at the foot of the cross, will you join with me in prayer this morning? I want to ask first that we stay in prayer for our sister Karen Hadelberg, who is now uh, working to do well by what is remaining of uh, Doris von Hermann's estate and working to be a good administra uh, administrator, working with um, the people that Doris set up in her trust. And I want to ask as well, friends, if you would pray for my family, uh, the, the Vleeks and the Christiansons and the Polands. Um, as many of you may know, I was earlier this week uh, in, this, in the state of Michigan, in the farm town of Decatur, um, to finally lay to rest my elderly grandmother. She lived to be 101 and a half, and uh, she died peacefully in her sleep, but we who are left behind are still grieving. So if you would pray for the Vleeks and the Christiansons and the Polands this morning, it would mean a great deal to me. But I know that I'm not the only one in prayer. And I know that I'm not the only one who's going to ask that we pray for our country right now, that we pray for wisdom and that we pray for um, justice and that we pray for healing. So how can we be in prayer, friends, this morning? Um, as you are moved, please, please uh, share your prayer requests with me and with our church. Yes, good morning. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> I have a prayer request for an acquaintance of mine. She, her name is Pearl, and she's in her 30s. And she has, uh, you know, a family with husband and two young children. And she was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, and is gonna, you know, have to do surgery and do treatment. And um, just praying for her recovery. And also, she has the situation where she, I, it looks like she went to visit, you know, relatives for the holidays. And she had her father like house it, but now she's going to stay longer in that area to do her treatment. And, and her father doesn't speak much English. And, you know, there's a local group of us who's going to help out with, you know, bringing groceries to him. That's amazing. But, Barbara. Yeah. But there's just, you know, it's just kind of a, the whole thing is just a kind of an unusual situation. So we will pray for, Pearl and her father and for this uh, group that's rallying around them and being the church. And I want to thank you for doing that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Are there others? Hi, uh, I have a prayer request. Yes. I don't see you. Uh, sorry. I'm looking through the. It's Sophia. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm sorry, Sophia. Uh, yes, please. Uh, just continued prayers for my family in Mexico, um, you know, with the loss of my grandma. Absolutely, Sophia. It was Anna, right? Your grandmother's yeah, name? Yeah, Anna. We will continue to keep your family in our, in our prayers, Sophia. Are there others? I was going to say also that... Uh, Elvia and uh, some of the sisters there are you know, are grieving for the loss of their mother, 
uh, also that uh, there's been illness there and uh, pray that they would, uh, you know, that coronavirus would not uh, affect any of them. We will pray for protection from coronavirus and, and just general well-being for your, for your family. Roger, thank you. Are there others? You can pray for our city just with COVID being so extraordinary here and rampant. Um, just pray that we can have healing and also the doctors and nurses and the people who are just going as hard as they can to help. Yes, I thank, I thank you for that, um, honey. We will, we will pray for LA. And, and just, again, to, to make sure that our church is a place of truth-telling, last week, uh, we were running at a rate of 250 COVID deaths in Los Angeles County a day. That's 100 more than uh, people who fall into homelessness every day in Los Angeles. And so we, we need to be in prayer and we need to be vigilant about um, quarantining and about um, observing social distancing. That's just a reminder. Thank you. Are there others? Yes, Irini. I, I can't unmute you, sadly. Yes, okay, I can hear you now. Uh, my, my grandson, Tyler, uh, Katie's son, and his wife and the child, they all got the virus, but it's not in a very strong form, and they're getting over it, but pray for the whole family. What's your grandson's name, Irini? Tyler. Tyler, okay. Tyler, and the t little boy is Theodore. And Betty is his wife. Betty? Betty, yeah. We will pray for Tyler and Betty and Theodore and, and their they family. Had, they they had it now for almost a month and they're getting over it. I'm so glad to hear they're they getting better. They survive it, but it's, you know, it takes a long time to get over. Yes. Well, it's yeah, lovely to see you this morning also, they, Irini. They will develop antibodies, I hope. Amen. Everything will work out. Thank you, Irini. Are there others? Yes, Petra. Yes, good morning, Pastor Quirt. Good morning, everybody. I would like to pray for um, the former city councilman, Tom Labonge, um, who very unexpectedly died last Thursday. He was only 67. And Tom Labonge was instrumental of keeping the friendship between the sister cities, Los Angeles and Berlin alive. Did a lot, you know, traveled a lot to Berlin, attended many German events, supported a lot, brought a lot of publicity to the German community as well. And, um, you know, let's pray for his wife um, who found him, you know, after a heart attack on Thursday. So he was only 67, not really sick. And he was very active. He had still a lot of plans. So I'm, I'm very saddened because I know him personally pretty well. Petra, we will keep um, Tom LaBorsch's family and his wife in our prayers. And we will also give thanks for his legacy of, of bridge building and um, just building relationships and understanding between communities. Um, how, how vital and, and blessed is that work? So we will give thanks for his legacy this morning too. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others? You know, I'd also like to pray for all our elderly church members who we used to see in church that who were not able to see on Zoom or by phone. We will keep them in our prayers, Barbara, and we will um, brainstorm together uh, vital and creative ways as our church to make sure that they stay a part of our church community until we can get back together again on the other side of COVID. Thanks for keeping them um, at the front of our minds this morning. I have to agree with Petra. Um, I, I knew Tom quite well too. I spent a lot of time with him hiking in Griffith Park. Is that uh, Ursula? Yeah. Well, we, we will be sure to pray for them this morning and give thanks for his life. Thank you, Ursula. Are there others? And I don't see her on here, but pray for Grit. I know she had COVID. Yes, of course. Um, I'm assuming she's doing better, but I haven't checked with her recently. So just mm -hmm. keep praying for her healing. And um, I wanted to give a praise that my brother and his family got over COVID and that they're okay. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Katie. I recently spoke with Grit and she is doing much better. She just had a very mild form of COVID, so she is fine. But she is really, um, she really worries about two of her uh, colleagues at work. 
who are both in hospital and in critical conditions. So it all started at her workplace. So she's fine, but she, and, and Hannah is fine, you know, but she's worried about these two colleagues. I'm glad to know that. Um, thank you. Uh, we, will, we will praise God for Grit's healing and we will pray for healing for her, her colleagues as well. That's quite scary. Are there others? Uh, I want to offer then a quick and, and uh, non-embarrassing welcome to, I think, who, uh, someone who was my second cousin once removed, um, Sandy Christensen, who's joining us th this morning all the way from Decatur, Michigan. So Sandy, welcome, and I'm glad you're here. Oh, and here's Glit as well. Well, we won't put Glit on, on the spot as she's, uh, as she's getting um, registered here. Friends, are there any other, any other prayers this morning? Will you pray with me? Lord, today, a day that we set aside to focus our hearts and our minds on you, to open our, our very lives, to make sure that you are still the centerpiece of our lives. Um, there is a lot that needs to be said. There is... It feels as though, Lord, a, uh, a dam has been breached in our society. It feels as though violence, lies, and mob mentality have overrun the, the best plans set aside by those who would keep peace, understanding, and conversation at the heart of our common life. Lord, we know that those who sow violence and those who live by the sword uh, are not long in the uh, long for the, the, the wider purposes that you have for this world. We know that in all things, your son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, will have the victory. But we ask, Lord, in this time that you would remind us of what that victory entails, that it is a victory without enemies that it is success without the failure of others, that it is a grand invitation to a fullness of life that we have even yet to begin to imagine, rather than a victory that will see us prospering and see our imagined enemies suffering. Lord, we ask that you would move in our hearts and in our country, and that you would call out the better angels of our nature as you do the same work in your son, Jesus Christ, to banish the worst demons. Lord, we pray for Karen this morning. We ask that you give her wisdom and insight as she um, picks up the pieces after the loss of her good friend, Doris. We pray for uh, the Christensen family and the Vleek family and the Poland family as we are all grieving uh, the loss of my grandma Vleek, Aunt Nell, um, but as we are also giving thanks for the unbelievable, uh, abundant and long life that you gave to her. Lord, this morning we pray for Pearl um, and we ask that you would be with her and that you would work mightily in her body to heal her from this cancer. And we thank you, Lord, the way you are working through the body of the church to surround her and her father with help and support and care. We pray, Lord, that you shepherd them through this dark time and that you deliver them safe and sound on the other side. Lord, we pray for Sophia and Roger and their family uh, in Mexico as, as they are still grieving um, in the wake of Anna's death. And we pray, Lord, that even in the midst of this, you would reveal yourself, that you would, that you would show signs of the kingdom and that you would lift their hearts and their spirits to the place where uh, you were calling them. Lord, we pray for the city of Los Angeles. We pray for the, the first responders and the those who are who are risking health and safety um, to to try to heal uh, so many who are falling ill in our in our our city, Lord, we pray that you would heal those who are sick, and that you would deliver us from this plague. That you would that you would give um, wisdom and uh, a long vision of what recovery from coronavirus will take. That we might not make short term political decisions at the cost of of long term healing. Lord, we pray for Tyler and 
Betty and Theodore and their family as they are recovering from COVID. And we give you thanks for their recovery. And we, we pray that you speed them on that way. And Lord, we give you thanks for the life and the legacy of Tom Laborsch, who did so much to build bridges rather than barriers, who uh, worked to make sure that we who come from different continents, we who come from different systems of values, we who come from different communities can nevertheless encounter each other in the full image of God. And we pray for his wife and his family as they are grieving that you would be with them and comfort them and inspire them. Lord, we pray for our elderly members. We pray for Katie and Thea. We pray for um, Bernard and Geta. We pray for George. We pray for Inga and Lilo. We pray for um, uh, Lydia and Wolfgang. Um, Lord, we ask that that in this time of isolation for Karen and and um, and for uh, Erica, we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and that you would inspire us who are here. Um, with new and creative ways to make sure that our seniors stay a part of this community um, as we are in these um, latter days of this pandemic. Lord, speed us through and bring us back together in safety. God, we give you thanks that Grit is recovering from COVID, but we pray still for her colleagues who are still sick, that you would be with them, that you would help them heal as well. And we pray, and we give you thanks rather, Lord, for the recovery of of, um, Phil and Casey and Jonah and Selah and Ezra from COVID and, and all those others, Lord, who may have fallen sick over the holidays. We pray that you work within them and through them and that you bring healing um, both in their families and in this wider world. Lord, we, we pray because your son, Jesus Christ, prayed. And we stand as we can, human and fallible though we are, and try to speak truth because your son, Jesus Christ, was human and spoke truth nevertheless. And so, Lord, we, we, would, we would fall back on his grace and his provision, even as we try to take steps forward in faith and discernment. And all the while, Lord, we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Vater unser im Himmel, geheiligt werde dein Name, dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie im Himmel, so auf Erden. Unser tägliches Brot gib uns heute und vergib uns unsere Schuld wie auch wir vergeben unsere Schuldigen. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöse uns von dem Bösen. Denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. I want to begin announcements by just saying thank you to our church. Thank you for giving Katie and me a time at the end of the year and the beginning of this year to be with our families. It was the first time that I have spent Christmas Eve with my family in eight years. And so um, I just want to give thanks to the church um, that that this terrible pandemic um, did open a small window um, for some some real um, rest and healing for, for Katie and me. So thank you to everyone. I also want to say thank you for giving me a few extra days at the end of last week to go to Michigan to be with my family um, as we laid my grandmother to rest. Um, Having that time and having that space was enormously healing. And so I just want to say thank you to the church for that. Then I want to invite you to return to this Zoom call this coming Wednesday, when we will pick up again on our series of one book of the Bible per week. We will resume with the book of Esther. The book of Esther is a a story of, of wonderful political intrigue and, uh, and how uh, an, an exemplary story of how uh, righteous people might uh, conduct themselves inside the halls of power uh, that they find themselves in the midst of. And it is also the only story in the Bible to never mention God. How in the world did this book make it into our scripture? Well, we're going to explore that question, and we're going to explore the question of how we, the people of God, might be productively involved for the case of justice and righteousness, goodness and love in the midst of the political situation in which we find ourselves. So I hope that you will turn in, uh, tune in rather, uh, for this Bible study at 6.30 on Wednesday. And if you were planning on attending, I hope that you actually read all 10 chapters of Esther as it is a continuous story and very difficult to uh, dissect uh, only a single chapter. 
I will be resuming with the Broken Middle podcast uh, going forward. And so um, look for more uh, releases uh, coming down the pipeline. I have a few in the can. Um, I have one, uh, an interview with our preacher from last week, uh, the Reverend Kirkpatrick Tyler, about homelessness and Skid Row in Los Angeles. I also have one uh, interviewing my father-in-law, Tim Welch, about uh, his, his lifelong work to study uh, the role of Africans and Africa in the Bible. And uh, you might be surprised to know that there are far more Africans in the Bible than there are Europeans. In many ways, Africa has had a far more decisive influence on the foundational documents of the Christian faith uh, than Europe has. And so as we are discerning a world in which balances of power are shifting, in which uh, we are more cosmopolitan than ever, uh, I hope that you'll tune in to listen to that podcast to see how we might give credit where credit is due and see what God is saying to the world through the scriptures in our own time. I also want to thank you, uh, those of you who, who uh, really uh, s- stepped up and, and uh, helped the church at the end of the year. Um, we are very grateful to you. Some of you gave to our special technology fund, um, which will allow us going into the future to be able to offer the production value that we were able to offer there at the end of the year on a more consistent basis. Uh, we rented that equipment uh, because we wanted Advent to be special. And so we're now back to our default operative uh, uh, mode here, but we are saving and working on getting equipment like that so we can continue to live stream um, in a more church environment uh, with uh, a little bit more technological savvy. So know that your money is going toward that. It is also going to be going toward our mission this year, which is to be more decisively about helping the homeless in the city of Glendale. We're going to be cooking for them every month, um, and there's an announcement of that, about that coming next week. Um, but we're also going to see if we can get more involved in housing for the homeless. And so there will be more announcements about that coming in the future uh, uh, weeks and months as well. So thank you for giving. Thank you for pledging um, your limited resources uh, to the abundance of the house of God. And, and may, uh, may our gifts this year go squarely toward um, mission and service to our community. Are there any other announcements for the good of our church this morning? Clicking through, seeing none, let us continue in worship.
Big thank you to Amador Solis. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said to them, You have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. So ends the reading from God's holy word. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are angry. But you know even better than we do that our anger is only a cover. In truth, we are sad and we are afraid. We ask that your son, Jesus Christ, who even now is mightily alive to us in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that he might change our hearts, that he might replace the paltry and frail faith that we have with the stalwart and unflinching faith that he had that he might replace our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. And that sad as we might be and scared though we may be, we might with his aid find ourselves surrounded, not by enemies, but by neighbors. In the words of my mouth, in the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was in the sixth grade, I had a friend who I'm going to call Eric. And Eric, like me, was not particularly athletic, not particularly charismatic and not particularly popular with the girls. Like me, Eric was skinny, pale, and nerdy. My brother, Brian, was athletic, 
He was charismatic and he was popular with the girls. And he and I were in the same grade. And he had a group of friends and they were the ones who ran the school, at least on the playground, as far as we were concerned. Eric and I would walk home from school almost every day in that year of being in sixth grade. And day after day, week after week, we would follow my brother and his friends as they walked in front of us. And I would hear Eric day after day, week after week, growing more and more resentful of my brother and his friends to the point where by the end of the year, that year in sixth grade, he would talk about committing acts of violence against my brother and his friends. He would talk about how much he hated them and how much he wanted to see them suffer and die. This from a sixth grader. If you do not believe that children in sixth grade are capable of great anguish, great anger, and great bitterness, I hope this is enough to persuade you. Because the truth of the matter is, we human beings are capable of unfathomable resentment toward our fellow human beings. And we are capable of cruelty as well. Eric's feelings toward my brother and his friends were not completely um, surprising. I mean, he did face bullying sometimes. Like me, he'd faced humiliation at the hands of kids who were more quick on their feet and who had a more ready word in the midst of an awkward situation. And like me, he found that try as he might, he just wasn't cool enough to break into the group that he wanted to belong in. But as I listened to him talk about committing specific acts of violence against my brother and his friends, I realized that no amount of anger and resentment was ever going to make things better in his life. And I watched as this friend of mine slowly and determinedly killed my brother and his friends in his own heart. The very next year was 1999 in Littleton, Colorado. The day after my birthday, April 20th, 1999, we had a call come into the school that somebody at a local school had brought a gun to school and we went on lockdown. We were seventh graders. And so we thought that this was just another grown up uh, spasm of un misplaced fear and anxiety until I walked into my parents' house in Littleton, Colorado. And I walked up to my mom's bedroom because she hadn't greeted me when I came in. And I saw her watching the news about something that had happened at Columbine High School, about five miles down the road from us. Two students, two high school students, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, had brought automatic, well, semi-automatic weapons and pipe bombs to Columbine High School and had shot and killed 12 people. When I saw this on TV, I was shocked, but I have to admit, friends, I was not surprised. If my friend Eric had had the means the year that I was walking home with him, I could have seen him doing something similar. And that's because he'd spent years killing these peers of his in his own heart. Columbine, left our city and our nation reeling. Something happened. A dam was breached that none of us thought would happen. A boundary was crossed that all of us thought would abide at some level. We couldn't believe that people so young could be capable of such cruelty and such violence, but they were. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold killed people in their school because they hated them. And they were able to do this. They were able to commit such acts of violence with such abandon because they had spent years killing these people in their hearts. Donald Trump, the man, is somebody who I've seldom mentioned by name in church. And I've 
refrained from mentioning his name because I want our community to find common course together. And I know that Donald Trump has commanded a lot of loyalty in our country. I know that he has stood for policies that many of our members of our church support. And he has done things that many of our members of our church have thought necessary. But I think all of us would agree that Donald Trump the man is someone who killed his neighbors in his heart. Anyone who disagreed with him or who broke with him publicly, he would disavow. Indeed, he would do what he could to destroy their careers. He was somebody who indulged in cruelty. Donald Trump the man killed his neighbors in his own heart, but Donald Trump the president killed neighbors in our hearts. Donald Trump the president, the head of the National Society, despite whatever policies might have been his, used his platform, used the prestige of the office he was trusted with in order to sow dissension, anger, and resentment in our national society. Donald Trump spent the majority of his time thinking about who his enemies were, in almost no time at all, thinking about who might in fact be his neighbor. Donald Trump spent a great deal of time being angry and saying, you fool. And in doing so, that anger disseminated and trickled down into our own hearts. And whether we support him or no, do not support him, we in our national society have spent the past four years and even more being angry, being full of resentment, asking the question, who is my enemy? Before we even think to ask the question, who is my neighbor? And now we are reeling, not a week after the president himself incited a mob to storm and siege the Capitol building of the United States. We are reeling in the wake of an executive trying to use demagogic power in order to run roughshod over the co-equal branches of government that are the hallmark of American democracy and part of the covenant and the contract that makes our ongoing civic life possible. This, like what happened at Columbine High School, is a breach of our common sense of what is possible. It's taking us into new and unprecedented territory. And it's filling us with fear about whether something like this will happen again. The temptation is twofold in our response. On the one hand, we can be tempted to try to minimize this event, to try to say, yes, it's tragic that five people died, but you know, it could have been a lot worse and it looks like the guardrails of democracy are indeed holding. We can say next time we hope the Capitol Police will be better prepared. But in minimizing this event, in trying to find ways to play down what happened in order to protect our own sense of civility and peace and organization, we miss learning from this mistake. We miss beholding this tragedy, this breach of confidence, this act of sedition for what it is. And we abandon the posts that each of us as citizens are summoned to, to be part of what is in fact a participatory democracy in which all of us, though perhaps not guilty, are nevertheless responsible. We're responsible for how we vote. We're responsible for who we support. We're responsible for what we let our own party get away with. And we are responsible most fundamentally to each other. On the other hand, the other temptation can be to see this as confirmation of all our worst inclinations, all our worst fears and all our worst resentments of a political side and party that we don't support. We can see this as an opportunity to stoke the fires of resentment and have them burn even hotter. We can use this as an opportunity to confirm our own biases that our enemies live among us and that they must at all costs be stopped. But the error inherent in this friends is the same error inherent in every single aggressive tweet put, out, tweet put out by the president. To let anger and resentment control our sense of our own citizens responsibility and conduct in the world, then the call of the gospel. 
we as Christians cannot make it our business to go looking and hunting for enemies. The question that ought to predominate in our hearts, the question that ought to reign and organize all other questions that we ask is not the question, who is my enemy? The question, who is my enemy, puts us constantly on the defensive, on our heel, and in a place of spiritual smallness. The question, who is my enemy, comes from a place where we see ourselves and what we have as scarcity, scarcity that needs defending from those who would encroach upon us. The truth of Jesus Christ is that those who are in Christ do not come from a place of scarcity. Those who are in Christ come from a place of provision and abundance, if indeed we will actually trust that God is with us. The question that ought to predominate in the hearts and the minds of the people of God is not who is my enemy. The question that ought to predominate in our hearts and our minds is the question, who is my neighbor? When we ask, who is my neighbor? We begin to see the image of God in people that we didn't expect to. When we ask the question, who is my neighbor? Connections, new possibilities, new friendships across boundaries immediately begin to suggest themselves. When we ask the question, who is my neighbor? We begin to be able to imagine a world in which we actually see each other as fully human. And even deeper than that, we begin to actually see and look for the image of God in other people as much as we hope that it is there in ourselves. When we ask the question, who is my neighbor? We open our hearts to espy the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, led by the Prince of Peace in every waking moment. Friends, my words today are brief, but they are in earnest. Maybe you, like me, have known someone in your own life who has shown themselves capable of killing their neighbors in their heart. Maybe you yourself have some repentance to do because you have let yourself participate either as an active participant or a passive bystander as people with a powerful platform have been killing our neighbors in their hearts all around us. I wanna urge you to take seriously what has happened in our country. I want to remind you that after the dam was breached in the wake of Columbine High School, there has been a violent school shooting in our country almost every year, and then in recent years, almost every month. I want to remind you that though there are guardrails in democracy, we cannot give support to those who make it an operationalized policy to lay siege to those guardrails in their rhetoric and in their actions. This, these guardrails, this social contract that we make with each other is part of the foundation of how we get along and how we go on, how there is a future for our democracy in the first place. We do not need to agree with each other. We do not need to even come from the same sets of values, but we must, friends, stay curious about who our neighbors might actually be. We must remember that Jesus Christ brought together the last people in the world that we would have expected. We must remember that the greatest servants of God in the Bible were the people that nobody expected anything from. The youngest of all the sons, Jesse, David. The apostle who led a zealous campaign, even violently against the church, Saul, who became the apostle Paul and who is responsible for the majority of our New Testament. And then a man from nowhere who preached about the kingdom of heaven and good soil, who preached about loving neighbors and being transformed, who preached that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and who was killed by an unholy union of government and mob, that this man became the source of the life of all creation itself. Friends, if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, then we are ready at every moment in every day for a powerful reversal of our own deepest held expectations and beliefs. To follow Christ, to be a disciple, is not a matter of holding fast to a doctrine. 
not a matter of standing in the confidence that we have the truth. It is rather a daily surrender, an admittance that we don't have the truth and that we must continue to follow in order to expose ourselves to it. It is a confession that we need to be saved day by day because the provisional resources that we have at our own disposal are not enough to rise to what we are called to do and to become who we are called to be. But it is also a trust, a grateful and powerful trust that God will intervene and help us. That God in Jesus Christ is even now making available resources that we do not control ourselves, but that we are invited as children of God to participate in, to receive, and to share. So friends, I want to encourage you with the words of Jesus. Do not say of anyone, you fool. Do not maintain anger at your brother or your sister. Make friends quickly on the way to court. Because if we maintain a posture of resentment, if we persist in the politics of suspicion, if we let the question, who is my enemy, overrule the question, who is my neighbor? Friends, we will live in a prison of our own making and we will not get out until we have paid the last penny. Do not let scarcity control your hearts. Trust in the true abundance of God. Ask not, who is my enemy? Ask the far more dangerous and exciting question, who is my neighbor? My friend Eric began to heal as he began to discover and explore his own gifts rather than resenting the gifts given to others. And now he's leading a life of creativity and of abundance and of health. Friends, God gives us freedom freedom to choose whether we will receive his call on our lives and live according to the vocation to which he has called us and the mission he has set before us collectively. 
but he also gives us freedom in our own unique ways to refuse that call. Friends, let us be good stewards of freedom that we, in the time given to us, might be a part of the kingdom of heaven breaking into this world. Let us be ambassadors of grace. Let us be arbiters of love. Let us be citizens of justice. God will give us the grace, the guidance, and the rebuke when we need it. Ask not who your enemies are. Ask instead who God is giving you as a neighbor. Go in peace. As you've known me to do, I'm now going to go join Katie in the kitchen.